Hey everybody, good morning and welcome to Christ Community Chapel. So, so, so glad you're here. Uh, welcome those of you over in East Hall, those of you tuning in wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, welcome. All right, these last three weeks here at the Hudson campus, we have hosted what we call the Edge Games, which is the kind of the pinnacle for our middle school calendar for our middle schoolers. It's like the Olympics for middle school kids here. And that means hundreds of kids were here these last three weeks to go through this wild competition. The good news is our building withstood it one more time, which is great. My wife Karen and I decided to go to this last Friday, which was the finale, just to experience it some, and it was amazing. I am a great believer in the kids of this church. Uh, but I also found out something about myself, and that is I am old. <laughs> and I realized that not just by the energy of the kids and everything, but I also was looking around at some of the middle school parents and realizing that I knew them when they were in middle school. And there is something great about that, though. I went home so grateful that I could be a part of a community like this, part of a church like this so long, that I could watch middle school kids grow up and have middle schoolers of their own, who they are raising to love Jesus. So that was great. All right. We are in a series on the Ten Commandments where we are looking smack dab in the middle of the law of God and we are looking for love. And we're looking for love because Jesus says that's what we'll find if we look at his law. A man walked up to Jesus and asked him what the greatest law was, what the greatest commandment was, and Jesus responded, love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then he said, every law that God has ever made rests on this foundation of love. So we are looking at the fourth commandment today, and that's the commandment to rest, the commandment of the Sabbath. It is actually the longest commandment of the ten, not because it's the most important. It might be because God knew that this would be one of those commandments we would try to kind of obey the letter of the law and miss the love in this law. All right, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus chapter 20, or you can wait for it to come up on the screen. If you're over in East Hall, I know it's dark there, you can look it up on your phone or just wait for it to come up on the screen. I'm going to read verses 8 through 11. This is what God says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." This is God's word. How have you noticed there are actually two parts to the commandment? You know, the first part is about work. Six days you shall labor, God says. Six days you're going to work. What if the commandment ended right there? What if that was the fourth commandment? Where God just said, hey, here's my fourth commandment to you. Six days you need to work. My question is, why work? Why did God create a world where we work? He didn't have to. He could have done it a different way. And there isn't anything that we do that wouldn't be easier for God to do himself. Right? I mean, if you've ever tried to make a bed with a toddler, you know, it's infinitely easier just to do it yourself. How much more for God to do something himself than for us to work? So why work? And then there's the second part of this commandment which is rest. God says on the seventh day, you rest. No work. And the question I have is why? Why rest? Why did God make rest part of the rhythm of life? Why is it so hard for us to rest? All right, let, me, let me tell you this. There is a curve in the human soul. There is a crookedness 
inside of your soul and inside of my soul, which means we all have a proclivity to kind of veer off. It's almost like a, if you've ever driven a car that was out of alignment and you take your hands off the steering wheel and you can just feel it drift. If it's way off of alignment, then you take your hand off the steering wheel and it goes right into a ditch. It's the way every human soul is. And the commandments, particularly these 10 commandments, are designed to show you and me the curve of our souls. And I want to take the time right now to put something in your heads. I want you to keep this as we go through the rest of this series. Every time you break the law of God, you are breaking yourself. Every time you sin against God, you are sinning against yourself. And what I mean by that is that God gives us his word, almost like an architectural design. He made us, more like an owner's manual. And so every time that there is something that God says for you to do or to not do in his word, and you say to yourself, I know God wants me to do this, but I'm going to do that. I know God doesn't want me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. You sin against yourself, and you break yourself. Think of any area right now that you know God is telling you you should be doing something else. It might be with your money and giving and generosity. The Bible talks all about generosity, all about how to use our money. And you may be saying to yourself, I know, I know, but I want to use my money like this. Or it might be with relationships and forgiveness. There might be somebody that God is telling you, you need to forgive them. And you're saying to God, I know you want me to forgive them but I can't and I won't. Or it might be with sex impurity. There's a reason that pornography is a multi-billion dollar industry. And every time that you get online or whatever and you're thinking to yourself, I know God doesn't want me to do this, but I'm just going to click on this one more time. Every time you break the law of God, you are breaking yourself. It's like throwing sand into the gears of your life. That's why love is at the basis of every law of God, because God is trying to say, this is how you flourish. This is how you stay whole, how you stay healthy. Listen, if you decide to never change the oil in your car, it will hurt you much more than it will hurt the Ford car company, right? The same is true with God's law, all right? So we are looking for love. In this fourth commandment, the Sabbath, the commandment to rest. So let me give you my three points. My first point is about work. How work is a gift of love for God. How work is a gift of love for God. Then I want to talk about rest, how rest is a gift of love from God, a gift of love from God. And then I want to talk about Jesus, how Jesus is the secret to real rest, to real rest. All right, first, let's talk about work. Probably my all-time favorite movie is the movie Chariots of Fire. It came out in 1980, which is a long time ago. It actually won the Academy Award for Best Picture that year. Chariots of Fire is the true story about two men who competed in the 1924 Olympics that were held in Paris, France. They were both from Great Britain. Eric Little was from Scotland. He was a Christian, the son of a missionary, and he wanted to be, planned to be a missionary himself. The other man was Harold Abrams. Harold Abrams was from England. He was the son of a Lithuanian Jew who felt acutely the anti-Semitism that kind of hung like a cloud about him. During the movie, each of the characters has a defining moment that shows the stark contrast in the way they each, they each approached work. All right, the first is Eric Little. He's training for the Olympics. There is nothing easy about training for the Olympics. It's terribly hard work to try to compete at the highest level, and Eric is starting to kind of fray around the edges, and it concerns his sister, Jenny, and she is maybe overly concerned, and Eric takes her aside, and he says this, Jenny, I know, I believe God made me for a purpose to be a missionary to China, but he also made me fast, 
And when I run, I feel his pleasure. And then he added this, to not run would be to hold him in contempt. What Eric Little says is to not work hard at this, to not do this to the best of my ability, is to hold him in contempt. That was his defining moment. And there's a defining moment for Harold Abrams. He also is working hard. He is trying his best to compete at the very highest level. His defining moment comes when he's getting a rub down after a hard workout. He's talking to his best friend, Aubrey. And this is what he says. I am 24 and I have never known contentment. I have pursued it my whole life. I don't even know what I'm chasing. And then he says this, because he's a sprinter, and now I have 10 lonely seconds to justify my existence. And even if I win, I don't know if I'll do it. Even if I win, I don't know if I do it. Why work? Why do you work, not just your job, but every part of work from raising children to making beds to creating meals to mowing lawns? Why do we work? One of the interesting things about the Bible is the Bible says that work actually came into our world before sin entered the world. Sin enters the world in Genesis chapter 3, but in Genesis chapter 2, after God makes Adam, it says this in Genesis 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Work was part of our world when our world was absolutely perfect. Now, keeping a garden when there's no such thing as a weed is probably pure joy, right? You plant the seeds and they shoot up and they're all healthy and they're bursting with flavor and beauty or both. Right? When you would garden, you would say, when I garden, I feel his pleasure. Right? It'd be great. And then sin enters the world. And with sin, that means that because work existed before sin, it means that sin is not a curse. But because sin entered our world, work is now cursed. And there's a difference. And what it means that work is cursed, it means two things. One is that work now comes with frustration. There are weeds, there are disappointments, there are setbacks, there are things that we experience, all of us, in the work that we do. But the second thing that it means, it means that work can now be misused. We can actually try to get work to do something in our souls it was never designed to do. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But for the Christian, there is something unique about work. Uh, these are Legos. They're huge Legos because I wanted you to be able to see them. I don't know if you've ever seen a competition with Legos. I just saw a commercial, and I haven't seen the show, for this Lego competition where they, they create like a Lego world that's as big as a stage or something, and, and it's just magnificent. It's amazing. Right? There, there are houses and cathedrals and arches and roadways and everything. And then if they lose, it look, I don't know if this is what happens, but then somebody takes a baseball bat and hits it. Right? And they're, they're all spread all over. That's our world. It's like God created this perfect world where every single Lego was in its right spot. And it was magnificent. Everything exactly the way he wanted it. And then sin enters the world and it's like we hit it with a baseball bat or a thousand or a million or a billion little hits. And now we know because we can feel that our world is wrecked. And it is like Legos. Because we can see part of our, part of our world and we can see the beauty. We see what it should be. We can imagine what it should have been. And for the Christian, work is different. Because a Christian, we are called to reimagine the world and what it should be, what it could be, what God wants it to be. And so our work is taking a Lego and putting it back in the place where it should be. Every time that you do something that brings order out of chaos, every time you pull a weed, every time you mow a lawn, every time you are raising your children, every time you make a sale, every time you weld a joint, if you are a Christian, you can offer that to God as a gift, which is why Paul the Apostle 
in Colossians chapter 3 says this, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. He writes that to slaves. And he was saying, listen, if you are a slave and you are a Christian, work changes for you. It means when your master asks you to do something, it's not just him that you do it for. You do it for Jesus. Everything you do, taking a Lego, putting it back, every time you write an injustice, every time you do anything, you do it for Jesus. Several years ago, I started, uh, whenever I would use a public bathroom, I started cleaning up some before I'd leave. And I did that because I, uh, I thought one time, I thought, what if Jesus was going to use this bathroom next? What would I do? And so now, whenever I use a public restroom, I will wipe down the counters and pick up some stuff on the floor, and, and then I wash my hands thoroughly. <laughs> but what I'm doing every time is I'm just trying to take a Lego and put it back in place in this massive world where God had something in mind when he made it. And now because I am his, I try to see what he wanted. And then everything I do, I want to be putting the Lego back into place. So work, if you are a follower of Jesus, can be a gift you do for God. And when you do that, then God says to you, I have something for you. And that brings me to rest. Rest. Right? Rest is the gift of God for you. A gift of love for you. Why is rest so hard? Why is it that we struggle with not working? You know, God brings the Israelites out of Egypt right before he gives the Ten Commandments. Right? He brings them out of Egypt, out of slavery, 400 years of slavery. And he says as a reminder that you are no longer a slave because a slave, their worth was determined by their work. Right? A slave that could not work was worthless. And God when he brings them out of Egypt, wants to remind them, and he gives them this command, so you will remember that you are no longer a slave one day a week, no work. Seems like it'd be the easiest commandment ever, don't you think? I mean, if you went to a job, and you got a new job, and they took you to HR, and the HR person said, oh, listen, we have one rule here, and the rule is you have to take a day off, fully, completely. I think you'd go, uh, I can swing that. I'll take a day off. No work, right? Why is this so hard for us that God made it a commandment? And why did he spend so much time closing loopholes? Look what he says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son, or your daughter. You can't get them to do the work that you want them to do. Your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. It's amazing the dignity in just that sentence, right? Because it gives dignity not just to you, but to children, and then even a kindness to animals. It really is quite remarkable. But why does God feel the need to make it a commandment to say you cannot do any work, you need to take it off. And the reason is because God knew it was much easier to take a person out of slavery than to take the slave out of the person. It's much easier to take the person out of slavery than to take the slave out of a person because of the curve of our souls, right? The, the brokenness deep down within us that we, we long to get our worth from something that we do, something that we accomplish, so we can say, this is me, this is me. Won't you care and love me? That is why Harold Abrams would say right before the 100-yard dash, I have 10 lonely seconds to justify my existence, and even if I win, I don't know if it will work. Where do you get your worth? It's interesting, in our culture, we have a phrase, net worth. Net, wild, your net worth is not determined by the quality of your relationships, by the depth of your love, 
Your net worth is determined by the amount of money you accumulate from working. So your worth is connected to your work. And so it goes. And so we were always trying to find our worth like that. And then God comes and he says, listen, the human soul was not designed to find worth in work. It was designed to find worth in love. Your soul was not designed to find your worth in what you do, but your worth in whose you are and who loves you. And God says, I have already loved you. Which is why worship is always a part of the Sabbath. The Sabbath that God gives is not to be spent just in curling up with your favorite book or watching NFL football all afternoon. It was to come and worship together to remind ourselves who God is and what he has already done for us, how he feels toward us. So we gather and we say, you are the Lord our God who rescued us out of the house of slavery. God says, I loved you before you knew who I was and I came for you. Work is a terrible substitute to try to get your worth from work. If you do that, you will always be a slave. You will never truly rest. But God comes to you and he says, I can make you a son. I can make you a daughter. And that brings me to the third point, which is Jesus. Jesus, the secret to real rest. In Matthew chapter 12, uh, Jesus gives himself an interesting title. The title is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I am the king of rest, which sounds like a tagline for a mattress commercial. Right? Jesus is saying, if you want to have real rest, real rest for your souls, you must come to me. Why would he say that? Because there's something different about rest for your souls. You know, sleep experts will say that there are stages of sleep. Right? And there's a stage called REM, rapid eye movement. And if you do not have that, if you are awakened before you experience REM sleep, or that stage of sleep, you will not wake up restored. The Sabbath rest that God promises is that REM sleep for the soul, which is why the psalmist would say this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. The question is how? How do we get that kind of Sabbath rest? And the answer is Jesus and what we call the gospel. And the gospel is this, that Jesus knows you, that Jesus loves you, that Jesus came for you, that Jesus died for you, that Jesus resurrected for you. And in doing that, he not only offers you forgiveness, he offers you restoration. He offers to restore you piece by piece of the brokenness that is you, as the Lego you, that God can put you back together again. To really rest requires us to know the gospel to believe the gospel, to live the truth of the gospel deep down. But because of what Jesus has done, he gives us rest in a couple of ways. He has us rest from hiding. We can rest from hiding. The very first thing that Adam and Eve do after they sin in Genesis chapter 3 is they hide from God. And we have been hiding one way or another ever since. I was down in Florida last week. I, uh, I always preach once a year at this church in Florida in February. Somebody has to do it, so I volunteer. But after uh, we, I preached, we went out to dinner with some people that I didn't know very well. And the dinner lasted a fairly long time. And when I got back to my room, I was just exhausted. You know why? <laughs> because it's work to be the ideal me. It's work to try to be the best version of me. And you know that, right? Some of you are here even today trying to be the best version of yourself and you go home from church and you're, you're tired. And I want you to know, Jesus knows the worst version of you. Jesus knows the real you and he still loves you. 
so you don't have to hide. There is something about Jesus that lets me rest from always wanting to be the best version of me. There's a scene in Chariots of Fire where Eric Little is in a sleeper car of a train and they pull into the station and the porter knocks on the door and he opens the door and he wakes Eric up. And then he asks them, how did you sleep? And Eric Little responds, I slept like a log. And the porter laughs and says, you must have a clear conscience. And Eric smiles and he says, far from it. Oh, I find that fascinating that even Hollywood would connect his ability to rest not with a perfect conscience, but with a perfect savior. Because Eric Little was saying, I'm already loved. No wonder he could say, when I run, when I work hard, I feel his pleasure because I'm not trying to earn his love. It's something else. The other thing that the gospel helps us find rest from, or what the Bible calls dead works. A dead work is a work that doesn't work. It's a work that doesn't do what we hope it would do. And the Bible talks about good things that we do to try to make us ourselves feel like we are worthy. Checklists that we can check off to say, see, I'm a good person. Now God will love me. Like a child coming home from school with a good report card or with an award and hoping that that will make her parents love her more. And that's why Harold Abrams, right before the last heat for the 100-yard dash, says this, I have known the fear of losing, but now I'm almost too afraid to win. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, what if all the work, what if all the work in the world doesn't work to make me feel worthy? Listen. Behind every law of God is love. Love for you. Right? What God says to you is, listen, I know, I know. I didn't design your soul to get worth from what you do, from what you produce. I designed work so that you would have something that you could give me, where you could feel my pleasure, where you could help put, restore the world, reimagine what I want. But he says, I want to give you rest. Rest from hiding. Rest from trying so hard, needing to work all the time to try to prove your worth. If you want to find rest for your weary soul, God says, you need to go to my son Jesus. Because Jesus has already done it for you. Since some of you were hoping that I would give you a list of what you could do and couldn't do on the Sabbath. I will not give you a list. What I want to do is we're going to close the service with worship, with kind of an extended time of worship. And I want you to be asking God as we worship, am I misusing work? Am I trying to use work to give myself worth? And then I want you to Receive the rest that he offers through Jesus. I want you to re remind yourself of the gospel, that Jesus knows you, that Jesus loves you, that Jesus came for you, that Jesus died for you, that Jesus resurrected for you. And find rest for your weary soul. Because God knows that he designed the human soul not to get your worth from work, but to get your worth from love. And that's good news. Because for this God of the universe, love matters most. Love matters most. Would you go ahead and pray with me? Father in heaven, we uh, come to you and I am so, so grateful. I'm grateful that you have get, decided to give us work to do. But as followers of Jesus, we get to look at work differently where we every day have a chance to pick up a Lego, put it back into place, and do it as an act of love for you. But I'm grateful that you give us rest. And you didn't just tell us you need to rest. You gave us Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. And because of what Jesus has done for us, we can rest from hiding, we can rest from working. We can rest because we are already loved 
and love perfectly. Father in heaven, thanks. We worship you now, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.